Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Welcome all. It's a very special uh, pleasure to welcome Itamar Rabinovich to the University of Scranton today. One of Israel's most distinguished diplomats, scholars, educators, negotiators, and higher ed administrators, Dr. Rabinovich is also known to some of us for his Scranton connection. In this community, that figure is right up there with his other extraordinary achievements. And his family is here to prove that. <laughs> To mention some of these other achievements, Dr. Rabinovich has been Israel's ambassador to the United States, its chief negotiator with Syria, and president of Tel Aviv University. He's the author of several books, including The Brink of Peace, Israel and Syria, Syria and Waging Peace, Israel and the Arabs at the End of the Century. Dr. Rabinovich is a member of the Trilateral Commission and serves on the International Advisory Board of the Brookings Institution. Currently, he is Distinguished Global Professor at New York University. Dr. Rabinovich has spoken here on several occasions on Israel's relationship to its neighbors, to the U.S. and to the world. Always, alas, an important and difficult subject. That said, I know no one who can do more justice to it than he. His topic today is Israel in the U.S. and the rest of the world. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Evanovich. <clears throat> Thank you, Sandra, for, <clears throat> for this very kind uh, introduction. Uh, I've been friends with Sandra and Maury for, for years. My mm -hmm. My cousins are, are here, and Scranton is in place. I'm delighted to, uh, to be here once again. Oftentimes, when I've been asked to talk or write about <coughs> uh, America and Israel, or the United States and, and Israel, my initial point has been that there is no plain bilateral relationship between the United States and Israel, because uh, the United States always looks at Israel as part of a larger region called the Middle East. And from the very early days of the U.S.-Israeli relationship, the United States of Washington has always looked at, uh, at Israel uh, as part of that region and it, its relationship with Israel uh, in the context of its relationship with uh, the larger Arab world. Uh, President Roosevelt, at the a couple of years after the end of World War II, in 1947, met with uh, King uh, Ibn Saud of uh, Saudi Arabia and was given a lecture, uh, was lectured by the king about the importance of the Palestine question. And uh, President Roosevelt famously said that in half an hour he learned more about this question from the king than he had learned for many years, over many years, from many, many experts. This was a nice turn of phrase, but uh, it, it reveals <coughs> the connection that had existed between the American view of the region um, as a whole, with important geopolitical interests, first and foremost oil, but not just oil. The Middle East is an important part of the world. Um, in the high days of the Cold War, uh, almost every communique published by the Kremlin about the Middle East would end with the famous phrase, um, the government of the Soviet Union cannot remain indifferent to events that take place so close to the southern borders of the Soviet Union. Um, the Middle East is on the southern borders of the Soviet Union and was therefore very strategically located at the height of, of, the, Cold, uh, of the Cold War. It, also <clears throat> is uh, the location for important international passageways, the Suez Canal, which uh, at the heyday of, uh, or during the heyday of the British Empire was the lifeline of the, uh, uh, of the British Empire. So it is an area of immense geopolitical uh, significance. And uh, when the State of Israel uh, came to be born in 1948, 
it, it was born three years after the end of World War II, when two things happened. First, the United States became a superpower, uh, interested, involved uh, in international affairs. Gone was the isolationist mood of pre-World War II. Um, former great, uh, great powers of the, uh, call it imperial and colonial age, Britain, France, were all in decline and the world was to be governed for decades by the uh, rivalry and competition between the two superpowers of the age, the United States and the Soviet Union. So Israel was born in, in the beginning of, of that new uh, uh, era, um, and uh, the Middle East soon became an arena for Soviet-American competition, so the Middle East was seen in Washington through that, through that lens. And in the days that uh, preceded the, the establishment of, uh, of the State of Israel, 47, 48, when, when British rule in Palestine was, was about to come, to come to an end, there were conflicting schools of thought in the United States about, about Israel. There were many who felt that the world owed the Jewish people a huge debt um, or carried a, a large cross uh, after the Holocaust, after World War II, and that it was time to give the Jewish people a state of its own and to start to normalize uh, the existence of, of the Jewish people uh, in countries that did not have the tradition of tolerance of freedom that the United States had. And therefore, people like President Truman and others felt that it was incumbent upon them to help bring about a Jewish state in, in Palestine. There were others like Secretary Marshall, General Marshall, uh, very important Secretary of State, who thought that it would be uh, awkward for the United States to support the establishment of a Jewish state in the middle uh, of an Arab world and, and a Muslim world, that it, it would become uh, a problem and the United States would find itself encumbered with uh, support for, for the Jewish state. And, and these schools of thought collided. With the result is that the United States did support the establishment of Israel and was the first to recognize it minutes after the Declaration of Independence in May 1948, but also that during the first decade of Israel's existence, the relationship with Washington was quite cold because Washington was reaching out to Arab countries, trying to build relations with Arab countries, hoping that since Washington, the United States did not have a colonial legacy, certainly not in the Middle East, uh, it would be seen differently by Muslims and Arabs than were Britain and France, and that it could build a friendly relationship with Arab countries and that its relationship with Israel need not interfere with that. So I'm, I'm emphasizing this point because we'll come back to it when we get to the Obama, uh, the Obama administration. Uh, and it was only in 1958 that the United States, the Eisenhower administration, understood that uh, this was uh, <coughs> a hopeless dream or, or vision that uh, Arab radicals um, at, at the time were committed to, uh, to, be, to being pro-Soviet, that they were anti-Western, not just because the Brits and the, and the French had a colonial legacy in the Middle East, but because the Arab and Muslim world had a problem of, of coming to grips with modernity and America is the foremost Western power, the symbol of West, Western culture, and symbolized, indicated to them everything that was wrong with their own society and uh, with their inability to come to terms with, uh, with these modern uh, Western, Western societies. So President Eisenhower uh, went to a change of policy. Uh, U.S.-Israeli relationship became much, much better, though it took almost another decade until 1967 and the presidency of Lyndon Johnson uh, to bring about that close relationship that uh, we have all been familiar with during the past few decades. Now, the turning point was uh, 1967, the Six-Day War in 1967. Uh, in 1967, Israel captured Arab territories three times its own size, the Sinai from Egypt, the Golan Heights from Syria, 
and uh, the West Bank from Jordan. And this opened the way for uh, a potential Arab-Israeli peace. Up to 1967, all efforts to try to negotiate Arab-Israeli peace could not move forward because there was no symmetry between Arab demands and what Israel could, could offer. The Arabs felt that Israel was built at their expense, that it was sort of a Western bridgehead. They were humiliated by the fact that a tiny country defeated the whole Arab world. And uh, the minimum conditions for coming to terms with Israel were huge Israeli concessions, taking back Arab refugees, giving, giving up the southernmost tip of, uh, of Israel and access to the Red Sea in order to create a land bridge between Egypt and the Eastern Arab world, demands that Israel could not meet with. But once Israel captured these large Arab territories in 1967, it obtained the <coughs> bargaining chips. And it did not claim sovereignty over the Sinai, it did not claim sovereignty over the Golan Heights. There was an open issue of who was really sovereign in the West Bank and Gaza, and parts of historic Palestine. But definitely, <coughs> the basis for what we came to know as territories for peace was laid in 1967. It took another decade, 1977, when this was first implemented between Israel and Egypt. Um, in 1978, um, there was the famous Camp David conference, uh, where Israel's Prime Minister then, Menachem Begin, and Egypt's President then, Anwar Sadat, uh, with the help of Jimmy Carter, President of the United States, met at Camp David after um, about 10 months of negotiations, culminated it in the Camp David Accord that laid the basis for an Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty that was formally signed in uh, March 1979. So here was the, the first Arab-Israeli treaty, the first recognition uh, of Israel by a major Arab state, and of course a major role played by the United States in making that peace feasible. The principle that the United States could use its relationship with Israel in order to help Arab countries regain territory or obtain uh, other assets had been established a few years earlier by Henry Kissinger when he was Richard Nixon's national security advisor and secretary of state. Uh, he argued that uh, it would be senseless for the United States to lean on Israel, to pressure Israel to just give back territories to Egypt and Syria, because he said this would just play into the hands of the Soviet Union. We should use these territories as assets when the credit is ours, when we benefit from it diplomatically. And in the mid-70s, he began to implement that, and that culminated, as I just mentioned, with uh, Jimmy Carter brokering the, the first full-fledged peace treaty between Egypt and, uh, and Israel. Again, the 1980s were a wasted decade in uh, Arab-Israeli diplomacy, and the next major effort uh, to bring about Arab-Israeli peace was made in 1991. It was after the first Gulf War, when the first Bush administration liberated Kuwait. The Soviet Union had just fallen. The United States had just won the Cold War. It, it was a, a new order in the world. The United States remained the only superpower. It had immense prestige in the Middle East because it had just liberated an Arab country, Kuwait, that had been captured, or, uh, occupied by Saddam Hussein's uh, Iraq. And uh, President Bush and Secretary of State Baker decided to, to convert this unique standing and this unique prestige in order to try once and for all to resolve <coughs> the Arab-Israeli conflict. And they convened a, a peace conference in Madrid, Spain, in October 1991, and laid the foundations for the peace process of the, uh, of the 1990s. That peace process lasted almost a decade, and it, it brought about significant achievements. Uh, first and foremost, the mutual recognition between Israel and the PLO that was achieved in Oslo, Norway, and was signed on the White House lawn 
in September 1993 in a, in a very famous ceremony. Um, it was not a full-fledged peace agreement between Israel and the Palestinians, but it was a mutual recognition between Zionism or State of Israel and Arab nationalism as embodied by the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization. And it, it, it was a framework agreement that should have culminated six years later in a final status agreement between Israel and the Palestinians. This signing facilitated the way for Jordan uh, to sign a full-fledged peace treaty with Israel in 1994. My own negotiations with Syria, unfortunately, did not end in an agreement, but in the 1990s, after four years of negotiations, we more or less put together the shape of an Israeli-Syrian agreement. What was lacking was simultaneous political will. That is to say, we needed the Israeli leadership and the Syrian leadership to want that agreement at the same time. Unfortunately, during the past 20 years, Israel and Syria wanted uh, this agreement, one party at a time when the other party was not particularly ready. So we still don't have Israeli-Syrian peace, but we know what the shape of that, of that peace uh, is. And what also happened <clears throat> during the 1990s, because of the mutual recognition between Israel and, and Palestinian nationalism, was that several Arab states decided to <clears throat> start normalizing their relationship with Israel. Not establish full-fledged diplomatic relations, but have uh, diplomatic delegations. So we had relations since then with Morocco, Tunisia, uh, and several of the, uh, of the Gulf countries. Uh, that was another achievement of the peace process of the 1990s. Unfortunately, that peace process collapsed uh, uh, in, in 2000, uh, in the last year of, of the Clinton presidency, there was a very ambitious effort by our Prime Minister then, Ehud Barak, together with President Clinton, to, to move forward both with Syria and the Palestinians, for reasons that we don't have the time to get into. Uh, both collapsed, crashed in 2000, and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict was renewed uh, with what was known as the Second Intifada that broke out in September 2000. So again, what do we see here? We see uh, a United States, this time led by a Democrat, Clinton, who inherited uh, the Middle East policy of uh, George Bush, Bush 41, and decided to continue with it. He was nonpartisan about it, and turned it into a cornerstone of his foreign policy. And what uh, that policy was had, had two poles to it. One was to look at the two dangerous actors on the eastern wing of the Middle East, Iraq, under Saddam Hussein at the time, and Iran. Iran, as you may recall, in 1979 had the Islamic Revolution and has since been governed by a very radical group of clerics and their uh, secular collaborators who want to export the Iranian Revolution, who want uh, Iran, who used to be an empire centuries ago, to become the dominant power in the Middle East, and they've been expanding their uh, influence since then very in a very anti-American spirit. So the, the policy of Clinton uh, was called dual, uh, dual containment, to contain Iran and Iraq, and to build Arab-Israeli peace so as to lay the foundations for Israeli-Arab cooperation against both Saddam Hussein and the Iranians. That policy was not inherited, was not perpetuated by George W. Bush when he became president. George W. Bush felt that the collapse of the Arab-Israeli peace process in 2000 did not warrant further investments in Arab-Israeli peace, and he was very much influenced by a group of neoconservative intellectuals uh, to adopt the policy of let us begin with the eastern part of the Middle East. Let us topple Saddam Hussein, let's install democracy in Iraq, and let democracy spread from Iraq to, to the rest of the Middle East. Uh, the idea of democracy will topple the ayatollahs in Iran and will, will transform politics in the rest of the region. Well, as we know all too well, um, the declaration of mission accomplished 
uh, was premature. Uh, the United States found itself bogged down in, uh, in Iraq, also re-bogged down in, in Afghanistan. And for the United States to wage two costly and not so successful wars in a Middle Eastern country and in a country that just borders on the Middle East was a very heavy load. It, it reduced the ability of the United States to carry out successful policies in other parts of, uh, of the Middle East. And so uh, when President George W. Bush stepped off the stage in 2008, the legacy for the Middle East was, uh, was very mixed. The Israeli relationship with the White House during the 16 years of uh, the Clinton administration and the second Bush administration was exceptionally good. And I, I was lucky to be the Israeli ambassador in Washington during Clinton's first term and to witness the unique personal relationship that was built between him and late Prime Minister Rabin. It was a great affinity and uh, a great, uh, the outlook on, on the region was shared by the, two, by the two countries and it was just a wonderful time in our relationship. In a different vein, there was also a close relationship uh, with the George W. Bush administration. This was not necessarily expected when Bush was elected to power because somehow the Bush family, in the minds of many, certainly in the minds of many in, in the Middle East, was associated with Texas, oil, oil, Saudi Arabia, and many expected this to be sort of a pro-Arab, traditional, oil-oriented policy. Well, people in the Middle East did not know that George W. Bush was very different from, from his father, belonged to a different wing of the Republican Party, was a conservative Republican with a different outlook, and uh, <clears throat> became sort of a crusader for his ideas and the, the hope of bringing democracy to, uh, to the Middle East. Of course, 9-11 was the defining event of his presidency. It actually made him a real president. And many in the Middle East found themselves on the wrong side of 9-11 primarily Yasser Arafat and, and, and the Palestinians. They, they, they were seen as supportive of, of these ideas. Same thing for the, for the Syrian uh, regime. Okay, then uh, Barack Obama is, uh, is elected uh, president. Uh, Barack Obama comes with, uh, again with a very different perspective. He is very much disturbed by the sense of quote-unquote clash of civilizations, as if uh, Islam and Christendom are, are bound to be uh, rivals and, and enemies. He wants to repair that. He is against American exceptionalism, American unilateralism, and he wants to rebuild the relationship with the, with the Arab world and the world of Islam. Several indications of this during his campaign. And uh, then when he became president, one of the first things he did as president was to go to Cairo and give the famous speech about rebuilding relations with, uh, between America and, and the Arab and Muslim worlds. He also tried to, quote unquote, engage with Iran, also tried to engage with Syria. And he also came to the conclusion that uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict, particularly the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, was a major stumbling block to uh, achieving his policy goals and, and tried to lean hard on the Israeli government, uh, now headed by Benjamin Netanyahu, um, to free settlements and, and move quickly to a resolution of the conflict with the Palestinians. Unfortunately, um, while America in a way went left with the election of uh, Barack Obama, Israel went right. Um, the very liberal government of Ehud Olmert who uh, put a far-reaching offer on the table for the Palestinian leadership and was also trying to negotiate with Syria, was replaced by a right-wing coalition. Why, why did the Israeli public go to the right? The Israeli public went to the right because of ominous threats, first and foremost by Iran. In 2003, it was discovered that the Iranians were actually building a, a nuclear bomb and were building the missiles to deliver it. And this 
became the major preoccupation for many Israelis. It, uh, in a way, the Iranian threat concerns the rest of the world. We have the rest of the world in, in our title. Because why is it dangerous for the whole world for Iran to acquire nuclear weapons? For one thing, if Iran acquires nuclear weapons, it will have a nuclear umbrella. And the, the idea behind that is that Iran could behave like North Korea. Let us say it could become provocative and uh, <clears throat> be immune to, to punishment. How do you punish a country that has nuclear weapons and has, say, a leadership that looks irrational? Do you really want to, to provoke them? Uh, second, I Iran would then, could then do what Saddam Hussein did in the 1990s, but again with an umbrella, and that's start taking over the uh, weak, rich, uh, all producing countries of, uh, uh, of the Persian Gulf. Thirdly, Iran is one of the beneficiaries of the Iraq war. The Iraq war toppled Saddam Hussein, who belonged to the Sunni uh, stream in Islam, and opened, uh, opened the way for the Shia majority, that's uh, the heterodox Muslim sect, to uh, acquire priority in, in Iraq. And it so happens that Iran is also a Shia country, and Iran suddenly acquired a huge degree of influence in Iraq and <coughs> began to project its influence across, uh, across the region. Thirdly, if Iran acquires nuclear weapons, so will several other countries in the Middle East, Turkey, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, would not, would not sit quiet if Iran has a nuclear bomb. Uh, they would also seek it. The result would be that the non NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the treaty that regulates the uh, nuclear, or tries to regulate nuclear issues around the world, will totally collapse. And there may be sort of a nuclear anarchy around the world. This is not something one wants to tolerate. Finally, Iran is also building intermediate and long-range missiles. They can now threaten Europe, and four or five years down the road, they could also threaten North America. This is why the US administration wants to build anti-ballistic missile bases in Europe to intercept potential threats from Iran. So we do see that Iran is, is a global problem. But of course, if you live in, in Tel Aviv, close to Tehran, and not in North Carolina, you, you see it much more, much more vividly. So the Israeli public is quite concerned. What Iran has also been able to do uh, during the past decade was to build two bases on the Mediterranean to the north and to the south of Israel. It, it has in Lebanon uh, a militia, a terrorist organization, a political party, all under the same name, Hezbollah. And it has provi provided Hezbollah over the years with 40,000, not for 40, 40,000 rockets and missiles that, that can hit almost any point in, in Israel, <clears throat> and it is building a comparable base to the south of Israel in the Gaza Strip, where not the same numbers obtained, where the government is in the hands of Hamas, Islamic uh, Palestinian movement, also under the wings of, of Iran. And the reaction of the Israeli public to these threats is, was to, to go to the right. Normally people, when they feel threatened, tend to go right rather than, than left. So. Uh, there is a degree of disagreement between uh, the Obama administration and the Netanyahu government that has been clouding our relationship in the past two, two years. Now against this uh, background, I, I want to look at what is known uh, as the Arab Spring, the single most important development since uh, actually last December. Why call it the Arab Spring when it began in December? I don't know. Also. Uh, as an Egyptian friend of mine said the other day in a conference we attended together, he said, in the Middle East, we don't really have a spring. We have a very hot summer, we have a mild winter, but there is no spring and fall. But in any event, it's been a momentous development. It began in Tunisia in December, spread to Egypt in, in January, and then to almost every country in the region, Yemen, Bahrain, Morocco, Jordan, uh, not not Saudi Arabia at uh, this point, and more recently, Syria. It's an interesting case. 
Now, what, what exactly happened is that people in, uh, people in the Arab world became tired of uh, tyranny, corruption, and I think most importantly of absence of hope. Have to bear in mind that uh, in the Arab world, 60% of the population are under 30, and 50% uh, are under 25. A very young population. Also, the Middle East, or the Arab world, now has 330 million people. The Arab world in the next few years will have to provide 40 million jobs for the young people who graduate universities in the Arab world. There's no way that the regimes that have been in power in, in, in the Arab world for decades now, uh, most of them are still in power, can do that if they continue with the same, with the same policies. Uh, and uh, young people lost hope. And when people have no hope, and have now the, uh, the new social media, uh, they found that they can organize uh, in ways that had not been accessible to them before. Uh, you can organize a mass demonstration using uh, Facebook and, and Twitter. There is also satellite television. Uh, 15 years ago, there was no real information in the Arab world because everything was state radio, state television. You could listen to the BBC in Arabic or you could listen to the Voice of Israel in Arabic and get some information, but it was precious little. Now with the internet and with satellite television, everybody has access to, to information. Everybody watches on, on their television screens <clears throat> and sees you, if you live in, in Yemen and you see uh, a popular movement toppling the government in Tunisia or in Egypt, you, you may come to the conclusion that you could do the same in, in your own country. <coughs> so, all of, these, all of these developments converged to bring about the tsunami that has affected the Arab world. As I said, in, in December, they toppled the dictator in Tunisia. In, in January, uh, it was Mubarak's uh, turn in uh, Egypt. It then spread to Yemen, to Bahrain, and more recently to, to Syria. Now, what does it all mean? Are we going to have real democracy in most of the Arab world anytime soon? Not likely. And sometimes people confuse democracy with free elections. Yes, of course, free elections <coughs> are a necessary condition in order to have democracies. Necessary, but not sufficient. Because uh, if you just have a free election, probably in most Arab countries and most Muslim countries, an Islamist party will be elected. So you'll have a free election once. Uh, this has been the case in Algeria, this has been the case among, among the Palestinians in Gaza, when Islamists are voted to power, the next election fails to, take, fails to take place. What you need in order to have a real democracy is you need to have a civil society, a middle class, a rule of law, something very important, equal rights for women. You cannot have a real democracy when half of your population doesn't have full rights, the women. Minorities, minority rights should be respected. All these elements should be in place in order for a country, a region, certainly the Arab world, to become fully democratic. But what we are going to have is uh, uh, much more participation by larger segments of, of the population. Regimes would be more accountable, more transparent, and probably there go there's going to be a, a longer period of effervescence in, uh, in the region. Okay, so how do the United States and Israel see that? Um, in some respects, we see it in the same way, and in some respects, differently, because there are different interests. You know, the United States, as, as a superpower with diverse interests in various parts of the Arab world, has a very complex view of things. I mean, for instance, for you, Saudi Arabia, or for every Saudi Arabia is, is a key country. It is the single largest oil producer in the world. It has the capacity to uh, keep oil prices in place. Now when 
there are disruptions in Libya and there may be disruptions in other places, the country that, that can keep the price more or less at the same level is Saudi Arabia. If we have turmoil in Saudi Arabia and a serious problem with the flow of oil to Saudi Arabia and oil goes to 200, 250 dollars a barrel, and you think about the need to solve the financial crisis here and other places, then, you know, you have to wave goodbye to hopes of early recovery. So that's, that's a very important, uh, that's a very important uh, interest. And the United States has military bases in, in several countries in the Gulf because it also does think about uh, Iran. The United States needs to end the war in Iraq and needs to end the war in, in Afghanistan and neighboring countries <coughs> are important in order to enable the United States an exit. Egypt, you know, Mubarak, Mubarak clearly became a liability. Uh, he was getting old, he was getting out of touch with reality. He was hoping to pass power on to his son. There was a great deal of corruption around him and he became a liability. And when the riots against Mubarak started, the United States had a dilemma. Does it stick with Mubarak, a very loyal, effective ally for 31 years, or does it try to build relationships with the new forces, who may be the, the future of, of Egypt in, in years to come? And you could see the administration zigzagging between these two contradictory uh, restraints. Um, <clears throat> Syria is another story, because Syria is a radical country, is an ally of Iran. And the demonstrations and the riots that we've had in Syria uh, during the past two weeks are rattling uh, a pro-Iranian country, an anti-American country, and they are actually, from that point of view, a positive development, because they are weakening the radical forces. But if you think about it more deeply, you ask yourself, okay, let us say that the opposition topples the regime of Bashar al-Assad in Syria. Who is the alternative? You know, we have all witnessed that in the deliberations and the arguments over the U.S. decision to intervene partially in Libya. Who is the opposition? Do we know anything about, the, we know who Gaddafi is and we know exactly what, what his value is, but who is the opposition? Maybe there are Al-Qaeda elements among them, maybe uh, there are other radical Islamist elements around them. What, what is the alternative to, to Gaddafi? And what is the alternative to, to Bashar al-Assad? The single most important opposition in, uh, in, in Syria is the Muslim Brotherhood. So if Bashar al-Assad is toppled, do we want to see the Muslim Brotherhood come to power in Syria? I'm not sure, no, neither from an American perspective, nor from an Israeli perspective. Now, where do our perspective vary or, or diverge? Not much, but they do to some extent, because if you look at developments from, uh, from Washington, said it's, it's one perspective, and we look at them in, from Tel Aviv is another. I want to illustrate to you from personal experience what the difference in perspective is. Uh, in, in my own negotiations with, with the Syrians, one of the sticking points has been the question of the borderline. Let us say that Israel accepts to withdraw back from the Golan Heights. Where does it withdraw to? Well, we, our position is we withdraw to the international boundary drawn between Palestine and Syria in 1923. The Syrian position is no. You have to withdraw to the lines of June 4, 1967, a day before the uh, <coughs> start of the uh, Six-Day War. What is the difference between the two? The difference between the two is that in, on June 4, 1967, the Syrians sat on the shores of Lake Tiberias. Now, Lake Tiberias, you know, is a very well-known place. We know who walked on the water. Uh, it's not a very large lake. Uh, um, and I could see when I was negotiating with Secretary of State Christopher that he really had no patience for this. He said, you tribal people, you know, you are arguing over 500 meters there and half a mile there. It's nothing. Because yes, you are the Secretary of State of the United States, it's a whole continent, and 500 meters is really nothing. <clears throat> for people who live in, in the region, this is a lot. Said, you may remember a few years ago, Tom Friedman, published a, a very good book called 
the Lexus and the olive tree. He said, in this world, there are two models. There is the Japanese model, that was before what we saw now. Um, he said, the Japanese are very effective, very efficient. They produce this great car called the Lexus. This is the, the world as it, as it should be towards the end of the uh, 20th century. But in uh, the former Yugoslavia, in Bosnia, there is a civil war where Christians and Muslims kill one another. And among other things, they fight over control over a hill. At the, the hilltop, there's an olive tree. And the symbolic value of who owns the olive tree drives Christians and Muslims to kill one another by, by the hundreds. So that's the other model. And Tom Friedman says, so where do you want to be, with the Lexus or with the olive tree? So sometimes I, I had that, that feeling that we were negotiating all these hills with olive trees that for Israelis and Arabs have huge meaning and for somebody who looks at it from Washington or from London or from Oslo looks silly, insignificant, not worth spilling a, a <clears throat> any, any blood or any emotion uh, over them. So from where we are, you know, we look at Egypt, we looked at, at Jordan, said we have peace with Egypt since 1979, we have peace with Jordan since 1994, and these are pillars of our national security. It's very good to have peace with two of your most important neighbors. And the question that we, in a parochial way, ask ourselves is, are the new people going to respect the peace treaty? If the Muslim Brotherhood comes to power in Egypt or becomes a party uh, to power in Egypt, we know that the Muslim Brotherhood is against the notion of peace with Israel because in the eyes of the Muslim Brotherhood, Palestine, the whole of Palestine, including the state of Israel, the whole of historic Palestine, is Muslim land. And a, a country, a land that was once Muslim must not be surrendered to infidels, the Jews or, or Christians. So if you are a radical Muslim, you do not believe in the notion of peace with Israel. So if the Muslim Brotherhood become influential, not even dominant in Egypt, what is the future of our relationship? Or if of King Abdullah in Jordan is toppled by more radical elements, what is the future of the peace we made with, uh, with Jordan? So we tend to, to take, I admit, a somewhat parochial view because we are in, in, in the middle of all of that. Of course, in the longer range, we very much would like to live in a democratic Middle East. We would like the Middle East to be like Eastern Europe. And in 1989, when, when the, Berlin, uh, <coughs> the Berlin Wall fell, much of Eastern Europe became democratic. Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, uh, uh, the Baltic countries are functioning, parliamentary democracies, free, uh, free market economies. Other East European countries, Ukraine and so forth, are not that great, but certainly not the communist dictatorships they used to be. That's because in Eastern Europe there were the, some of the requisite elements for democracy and free market. Uh, these had been uh, modern countries earlier in the 20th century, and even decades of communist rule could not totally eliminate that. So they were ready to move on to a new age. The Middle East is not at that point. So it may take 10, 15, 20 years for the Middle East to become fully democratic, but the road to that point is going to be very bumpy, full of twists and turns, and we will have to live through that being part of, of the neighborhood. So here we are in, uh, in our uh, current relationship with, with Washington. We both look at uh, both look at what's ongoing in the Middle East with a mixture of hope and, uh, and concern. We both understand that uh, uh, it's important to move on with the uh, Israeli-Palestinian peace process because it is important for, for the whole region. Um, a few weeks from now, in May, Prime Minister Netanyahu is going to come to Washington to, to give a big speech at an APAC conference. And I know that he is is agonizing over what he's going to say. His right-wing instincts are not to say much. His responsibility as the ultimate decision maker, as the man with ultimate responsibility for the fate of Israel at a crucial moment, that responsibility tells him that he should come up with a much bolder plan for moving on in, in the peace process. And I hope that in May, a few weeks from now, we will get the second version, not the first one. Thank you very much.
be very happy to take questions or comments. Yes, please. Okay. The question was uh, for the benefit of of the backbenchers: uh, <clears throat> uh, where, where do I see Saudi Arabia going? So uh, the Saudis have been have been better than others in spreading the wealth. There's first of all, plenty of wealth. Um, of course, there is huge fortunes amassed by uh, mm -hmm. uh, by members of the royal house and and their relatives. There are, by the way, thousands of princes in Saudi Arabia. You know, if everyone has uh, several wives and 20 children and hundreds of grandchildren, there are, at the end of the day, thousands of, of princes. And it takes a huge budget to, to keep 5,000 princes happy. But uh, with, the price, with the price of oil being what it is, there's enough left to offer generous generous terms to, uh, to other people. There is, uh, Saudi Arabia is built on an alliance between the House of Saud, the royal house, and the Wahhabi religious establishment. The Wahhabis are a, a particular um, uh, <coughs> Islamist uh, group, a conservative, and the kingdom of Saudi Arabia was built through that alliance, and that alliance is maintained, so the religious establishment in Saudi Arabia is not revolutionary. And when they had one revolutionary person in that country, Osama bin Laden, he understood that he had to go out of the country and try to topple it uh, from, from the outside. On the whole, the Saudis until now have been doing a good job of keeping the bulk of the population happy and keeping an eye open. They are nervous about domestic developments. They are very nervous about what happens in Yemen on the border what happened in Bahrain is very close to them. In Bahrain, there is a Shia majority, and there is agitation nourished from Tehran. And when the royal house in Bahrain was besieged by protest, the Saudis looked to Washington and didn't see Washington moving, and they sent their own army to protect the, the regime. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I, I should say in comments, the Saudis were very unhappy with the U.S. treatment of Mubarak, in the way Mubarak, I mean, to put it from their perspective, the way Mubarak was ditched, said for 31 years, this man was a close ally and came to Washington and was always hailed as a great, and from one day to the next, he became corrupt, inefficient, had to be, had to be ditched. He said, you could do it more gradually, more subtly, you could take your distance over time, but not ditch him in the way, the way you did. There was a great deal of anger, and actually, uh, the National Security Advisor, Tom Donilon, is in Saudi Arabia now, trying to placate, uh, placate the Saudis. So, in, in brief, I think, you know, who could make predictions in, in this climate in the Middle East, but on the whole, I think, for, for the time being, they look secure. Um, I hope it stays that way. Yes, sir. The idea that uh, a state of Palestine would be what we declared in, in the fall, I mean, there was a big article in the right. New York Times uh, a week ago Sunday about that. Okay. There's, a, uh, <clears throat> there's an interesting uh, issue uh, over where we and the Palestinians proceed. The, the Palestinians now have a, uh, have a much more moderate, pragmatic leadership than they had under Yasser Arafat. Unfortunately, in retrospect, I think we, we have to come to the conclusion that Arafat never, never uh, intended to go all the way in, uh, in the peace process. In the year 2000, um, you may recall, Prime Minister Barak and President Clinton invited him to Camp David, uh, to a conference that where hopefully a final status agreement was to be signed, and uh, Prime Minister Barak put some very bold ideas on the table, but uh, Arafan did not sign on the dotted line, and he found a way 
out of uh, Barak said, I'm willing to give back more than 90% of the West Bank and, and the whole of Gaza to partition Jerusalem to do this and that, but in return I want you to sign on the dotted line two things, end of claims, end of conflict, and Arafat refused to do that. In 2000, and now, Arafat died in November 2004. He was succeeded by a much more moderate man called uh, Mahmoud Abbas or Abu Mazen. <clears throat> and the Palestinians have a very good prime minister called Salam Fayyad. Salam Fayyad is, a, is an economist, he's a PhD, um, worked at the IMF, and he came, to, he came back to, to the West Bank, uh, first as Minister of Finance and then as Prime Minister. And he said, I'm, I'm a student of Zionism. I looked at the way the Zionist movement built itself and eventually built, built the state. And we're going to do the same thing, bottom up. No corruption, efficient government, no terror, efficient security apparatus. And in a few years, we're going to be ready. And you know, if you sign with us, fine. If you don't sign with us, we'll go unilaterally. And what they feel now is that they are ready. And in September, they want to go to the United Nations and have the United Nations recognize uh, a Palestinian state uh, in, the, in the boundaries of 1967, admitted to, to the United Nations without agreement with Israel. Uh, now, we think that it's very problematic that, uh, because there won't be recognition. There has to be, uh, let's say that we understand that no final status agreement would be reached without us giving up about 94% of the West Bank, keeping 6% where most of the settlements are, offering a swap of land in, in the south of Israel so that the Palestinian state has the same territory that it had in 67, though not, not exactly the same boundaries. But in return, in return, we want the same two, two phrases, end of conflict, end of claim. Now, the most important claim that the Palestinians uh, have is what they call the claim of return. Say, every single refugee from 1948 and his or her offsprings now third and fourth generation has the right to go back to Israel proper. There are about four million of them. And, uh, you know, it's not, not feasible from Israel's point of view, so we want them to, to give up on the right of return, and they, they are very hesitant to do that. That is the ultimate test of the good intentions of the Palestinians. Or oh, the other side of the same expectation on the Israeli side is that we want you to recognize Israel as a Jewish state. Not to recognize that there is an entity called Israel, but that to recognize the fact that Israel is the national home of the Jewish people. These are going to be very important tests. If there is a unilateral declaration of the United Nations and 100 states support it, you know, all, all of these requirements are not going to be met. Second, the Palestinian leadership controls the West Bank. It doesn't control Gaza. In Gaza, there's a separate government under Hamas. It's not part of, of this. So, in reality, there's not going to be a functioning or a real state, even if there is a, a UN declaration or recognition. Now, the way, I think, to, to avoid that, to preempt that, would be for us to, to come up with, a, I said, a bold offer that revives the peace process and, and lays, lays down a, a scenario for moving on without unilateral steps. Um, I think it's also not desirable to the United States that this happen, but of course, if it goes to the General Assembly and not to the Security Council, there is no veto. So the United States may vote against it or may, let's say, bring some of its major European and other allies to vote against it, but you have an automatic majority in the UN for third world countries who, that, that would support it. So I think it would not be good for anyone if it happens, but it, it may happen. Yes, Maury. What is the current <coughs> influence of Russia and the break-off countries that resulted from the break-up of the Soviet Union right. and the Middle East? Okay, the, the question was, what, what is the current influence of Russia and, and other countries that emerged 
from the former Soviet Union on, on the Middle East. Say the, um, say the East European, the East European countries normally have a, are very pro-American and also have, have very good relations with Israel. That's <coughs> Secretary Rumsfeld referred to it as, as the new Europe as compared to the old, to the old Europe. And I think that that was not received fondly in, uh, uh, in Europe. Um, now, you know, parts of, uh, uh, parts of the former uh, Soviet Union, like Azerbaijan or Georgia and so forth, they all have their different uh, distinctive policies. They are not major, major players. Russia itself um, went through about a decade of humiliation, uh, being reduced from the second superpower to a weak, dependent uh, country. Uh, and they felt that they were being humiliated and tossed around by the United States. And much of Putin's policy was uh, to change that and, in a way, even to make up for, uh, for that. And um, uh, he, he used, of course, oil and gas as, as two very important natural resources that, that Russia has, uh, has plenty of. And has also chosen the Middle East as an area in which he would retaliate against American actions in other parts of the world. If, if the United States supported the Orange Revolution in, in Ukraine or supported Georgia in its, when, when it was invaded by, by Russia, Putin would retaliate uh, by recognizing Hamas or by providing advanced weapon systems to Syria. Now, there are two other interesting elements in, in the picture that make it more compound. One is that Russia has its own Muslim problem. There are very large Muslim minorities in southern Russia. And you know, the, uh, we, we all know about the brutal suppression of the rebellion in Chechnya, but there are other, other parts uh, of, of Russia that have large Muslim population where the central government and the Russian element are in conflict with the Muslim element, there is a huge decline in population of the Russians and rapid growth of the Muslims. So Russia is not going to become a Muslim country anytime soon, but the proportions uh, are going to be less comfortable for the, for the Russian uh, elite. Second is that the Russians have, a, uh, have an investment in Israel. There are more than a million Israelis came from the former Soviet Union. And there are people who are attached to Russian culture and they keep the Russian culture. They, it's typical for what we call a Russian Jewish family in Israel to send children to a normal Israeli school in the morning and to a special school where they teach in Russian in the afternoon in order to preserve the, the language, the, the culture. It's a, on the whole a very uh, sophisticated population, people who read read books and listen to music and have been a, a, an immense uh, addition to, to our population. But from Putin's point of view, this is a strategic asset. You have 20% of the population in, in a country are former Russians and he, he cultivates a relationship. Uh, he also looks in a somewhat different way on the two other large concentrations of, of Jewish communities from the former Soviet Union in the United States and in Germany, where there is a very large community, because for him these are strategic assets. You know, if you grow up in the KGB, you develop that particular um, view of the world. So that also colors the, the Russian view of Israel. But, so we have, a, you know, we have a, a fairly good relationship with, with Russia, but we don't appreciate some of what they do. Sandra, please. Are, they, are, there, are those two in conflict, or is there some way of... Um, yeah, okay. Um, so, uh, Sandra asked me about how do, how do I perceive or explain the notion of a Jewish state vis-a-vis -vis the notion of, of pluralism in, in the United States and, uh, and, and in other countries. <coughs> uh, 
Well, the confusion begins with uh, the definition of the term Jewish. What does being Jewish mean? And uh, being Jewish, I mean, uh, Judaism is, is a religion, but uh, Jewishness is uh, an ethnicity. And there is a Jewish people, and there is Jewish ethnicity, and part of, part of the Jewish people uh, uh, feel that, uh, like other peoples, you want to, um, you want to fulfill um, the notion, or to implement the notion of peoplehood by creating a nation, and that, that nation has a national home, and that's in, uh, that's in Israel. Other, other Jewish people have different views, uh, they assimilate, or they, they feel we are Americans first, we are British first, we are French first, and we are also Jewish in this or that, this or that way. So, uh, and when you say Jewish state, people do not always understand what, what you mean by that. So what, what do we mean by that? It's, so, uh, it's a Jewish state in the sense that um, it's the national home of the Jewish people. The Zionism is the national doctrine of the Jewish people that argues that the Jewish people is also a nation and like other nations it deserves to have a, a national home and then it becomes the personal choice of every Jewish person whether they want to to be part of the nation or just remain part of the people or even just remain part of the religion. So it's a confusing reality but that's what it is. So the definition of uh, Israel as a Jewish state is, is in that sense. It's the na national home of the Jewish Jewish people, and the most important law in that in that regard is uh, uh, is the law of return, which allows every Jewish person, even if they are only Jews, partially Jewish, to become automatically citizens of of the state. So it could be an individual story, or it could be the salvation of a whole community, as was the case in Ethiopia, or as was the case in the Soviet Union, where whole communities in recent years arrived and, and, and were settled in, uh, uh, in Israel. You know, when French Jews feel very uncomfortable today with uh, the relationship with the rising Muslim community in, uh, in, in France, what do they do? They buy apartments in Israel. They don't necessarily move to Israel full time, but it's nice sort of an insurance policy to know that if things get rough in Paris or in Marseille, you also have an apartment in uh, in Tel Aviv or in, in, in one of the other in one of the other cities. Now, I know that this raises huge difficulty. I myself had endless conversations with uh, uh, with Arabs, uh, Egyptians, and others who say we cannot comprehend this issue of uh, uh, of a Jewish state because if Judaism is a religion. If you say that Israel is a Jewish state, like saying that Egypt is a Muslim state. Well, actually, if you open the constitution of Egypt, it, it says in the constitution that it is an Islamic state. So the religion of the state is Islam. You know, who is, who is the head of the Anglican church in, in England? Uh, the Queen of England. So the, the idea that a certain religion has a particular place in the self-view and definition of, of a country is not that alien, but it's quite strident in our case because we are in the middle of a conflict, and this issue is is, is one of the components of of the conflict. Yes, please. Two questions. One is about China. More asked about Russia. China seems to be a long-term player, and they're in search of resources, a lot of which come from the Middle East, and they have some say at the United Nations as well. Uh, are they playing any role behind the scenes? And my second question is totally different. It's, should we read anything into the fact that Barack Obama has yet to go to Israel, and if he were to go, would he be greeted by the same surprise that Joe Biden got last year? Right. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Um, <clears throat> China is not a real player in, in the Middle East. It does in the Middle East what it does in Africa and other places, it's looking first and foremost for raw materials in the Middle East, mostly for oil and, oil and gas. It's, it's not yet a player, but we know that the Chinese are, are building up the military forces. They, they plan to be able to project power. I think that they are developing ambitions. I think that in years to come, we'll see China as a much more important player. Now, 
Uh, it's true that the oil, the oil is in Arab lands, but you need to pay attention to the fact that Israel may become an oil and gas empire in its own right. Uh, we discovered significant quantities of gas offshore uh, in Israel, and there's now a major effort to work on shale, shale oil in Israel. There's, a, uh, a, a, there's an American corporation that's making an interesting investment in, in shale oil. There was a story, I think, about 10 days ago in the Wall Street Journal about that, and there's going to be another story in Business Week. It could be huge. So uh, this may change over time. At this point, though, if you think about oil, you think about Arab countries. But Chinese love Israeli technology, military technology and other technology, and they have very high appreciation for Israeli inventiveness and, and creativeness. So we have, a, we have a reasonably good relationship with China, uh, but what the Chinese totally lack is, is the whole baggage that, uh, that Christians bring into, into their view of Israel, sometimes positive, sometimes negative, because of the common ancestry and, and the common heritage. And, uh, you know, so some evangelical Christians may be extremely pro-Israel, and some Presbyterians may be less so, and some Catholics may still uh, be under certain, uh, certain influence. It's complex between, between Jews and, and Christians. It's not complex between Jews and Chinese because the Chinese have no share of that. So the, the Bible, and it's not the alien, uh, alien territory. So they come burden free for good or bad. Uh, second, if Obama goes to Israel, well, I think he could make a, a world of a difference by going to Israel and reaching out to the Israeli public. I think he made a mistake. I mean, he made many mistakes in the Middle East in the first two years, and I think he, he knows that. The whole idea of beginning with a settlement freeze was not a good idea. I mean, uh, settlements need to be dealt with, but not as the first step. But the fact that he went to Cairo and went to Turkey and did not go to Israel, I think, registered. And when he goes to Israel and uses his considerable rhetorical skills to talk to the Israeli public, it could make a difference. But you know that the perception of Barack Obama outside the United States is of that of a very cold man. Uh, many world leaders complain that there's coldness in him, that they don't have the same rapport, good or bad, that they had with, they may not have liked George W. Bush, but there was a human being there that they, they were angry with, but there was a, an emotional give and take. They don't have that with, with him, and of course, everybody loves Bill Clinton. Uh, but uh, it's different with Barack Obama, who oozes that coldness. Uh, so I don't know how effective he's going to be in warmly reaching out to the Israeli public, but I think it will go a long way. Now, what happened when Joe Biden came was, unfortunately, uh, this, this prime minister, you have to realize, is the head. You need to have, the Israeli parliament has 120 members. We, are, we have a parliamentary system. The prime minister needs to have a majority in parliament at all times. So he needs to have 61. Uh, at least 61 in a coalition. He, be, he begins this with his own caucus of 28. So he depends on a very diverse coalition, and his first priority is to keep it in power. And Joe Biden comes, and the Minister of Housing is from another party, and makes this silly decision without consulting the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister is endlessly embarrassed. So that, that was a, a, a major, major faux pas. Uh, I'm sure that if President Obama come, uh, comes to a visit, the Prime Minister will beforehand make sure that uh, no surprises. Thank you so much. Uh, Ambassador Rabinovich, uh, it never fails that uh, you enlighten our dilemmas and com the complexity uh, that the world presents to us at this time. So we're very grateful. I should tell all of you that uh, 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 Dr. Ambassador Rabinovich has a um, piece on uh, the foreignaffairs.com 
which I will be able to send to all of you, a recent article, or brand yesterday. new, yesterday. And I, I'll make sure that you all get it. So thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate your taking time out of your professorship to be here. I do have some other announcements to make. Um, I could be saying goodbye to you until next fall, but we're not going to do that. Uh, the Schemmel Forum is joining forces as a programming partner with a newly merged entity, Pages and Places at Anthology. And we're going to be presenting three programs in August, informal programs, not on this site, but in the on the Anthology bookstore. And uh, mark your calendars for Thursdays, August 11th, 18th, and 25th for three wonderful programs. The first one uh, is going to be Bill Terstig and Gretchen Lutters on Two Citizens' Views on Marcella Shale. Uh, the second, um, Jenny Niles, founding principal of one of the most successful charter schools in the country, uh, the Haynes Charter School in Washington, D.C., will speak on profile of a school that works. And Mark Woody, at one of the region's most gifted and virtuosic violinists, will speak on, and I'm sure uh, demonstrate, what makes classical music classical. So we'll see you in the summer, if not before. Uh, I need to uh, say the, the proud mother of uh, Jenny Niles is sitting here, our faithful Shamalite, Maggie Niles. Thanks again for being with us. Bye-bye.